Okay, so this section we have to do a little more leg work, not just looking at the graph, not just doing an XY chart there. We're gonna do analytical methods, algebraic methods. If there is an algebraic method that can be done to get the exact answer, you need to do that limit. We're gonna to go to an XY chart or a graph if we have no other option here, okay? So your algebraic techniques, one, you're gonna to try to plug in, see if you get an answer for it. The second one is tons of algebra techniques. That's pretty much what we're gonna focus on in this video. You could factor, you can get rid of conjugate, you can multiply by the conjugates, you can multiply stuff out, you can simplify complex fractions. Those are the big four techniques that we're gonna use in this video here. And another thing that we're gonna use in the future, a different video, is the trig identity. All right, so the first couple of limits there, right? Got some pretty easy functions there. We could plug in, get an answer. That's what we're going to do on these functions here. So notice if I could just take that negative three and plug that in, that's gonna be negative nine plus two. That's going to give us a negative seven for our answer. Same thing here, I can plug that in. That's gonna to equal to the secant of seven pi over six. And we know that's the same thing as one over the cosine of seven pi over six. And hopefully you remember from your pre-cal days that the cosine of pi over six is a radical three over two. But since you're in quadrant three, from your all students take calculus, your cosine is negative in quadrant three. So it's gonna be a negative radical three over two. And anytime you do the reciprocal of a frac, I'm, I'm sorry, anytime you do one over a fraction, that's the reciprocal of that fraction. So this could be negative two over radical three. And then you're allowed to stop right there. It is okay to leave radicals in the denominator in this class, okay? So sometimes on the AP test, a lot of times they just leave that alone. If it's on the free response, they will accept it. You don't have to worry about it. If it's on the multiple choice, sometimes they'll leave it alone, sometimes they'll rationalize it. So you can kind of practice rationalizing if you want, but you're allowed to stop right there. Through the entire year, the radicals are okay in the denominator. <laughs> All right, now as I look at these problems, if I try to plug in here, um, I'm gonna get 16 minus 20, which is negative four plus four, I get a zero on the top. Here's what you can't do. You can't get a zero on the top and say, oh, I'm gonna get zero for my final answer because zero divided by anything is zero. That is completely false thinking. They lied to you before when they told you zero divided by anything is equal to zero because look what happens on this particular problem. If you plug in four to the bottom, you're gonna get 16 minus eight, which is eight, eight minus eight, which is also zero. You get zero on the bottom as well. Now, somebody lied to you before and said, when you ever get zero on the bottom, that's always undefined. Well, look what we got going on. You got zero on the top and zero on the bottom. You can't be zero and undefined at the same time, right? So we're out of the realm of normal things, what you're used to right there. We get to some very fun things later on where we see what happens when you divide by zero. Calculus actually allows us to divide by zero. Now, we're not ready for that stuff yet, so we're going to work our way up to it. But remember what we talked about in the last section is just because a function is undefined, if you're getting zero in its number, if I take that point away, or here a function is undefined, there is no point there. Who cares? I will get zero in the denominator. If this is the function one over x minus two, I'm gonna get zero in the denominator, but we didn't say that limit didn't exist. We actually did some stuff and we got an infinity for that, right? So you can't just say it doesn't exist or it's zero automatically, okay? And that's why the justification is always very important in this class. So here's all we're gonna do. Very easy problem. This whole section is just algebra. If you're strong with your algebra skills, you're gonna like this section, right? What I need you to do though, when we're doing the algebra, I can't just plug in yet. I need us to keep writing that limit notation each step of the way until we get to this part where we're just gonna plug in. I will model that for you perfectly in the notes. I need you to do that if we're gonna get full credit on our homework there. That's gonna be beneficial for us when we get to derivatives later on. And we'll go through the reason for that because if you don't write that limit notation and you don't remember to take the limit at the end of a derivative problem, huge, huge deduction right there on a test situation, AP situation, whatever, right? All right, so here's all we're gonna do. Here's gonna factor stuff. That's all it is. It's Real easy algebra one problem right there, okay? So if I go ahead and factor this, this is gonna be a simple x minus one, x minus four, and then x minus four, x plus two, right? Now notice I haven't plugged in yet. I haven't taken the limit yet, which means I need you for your homework, I need you to write that limit notation every step of the way. And then we're gonna do some canceling here, all right? The x minus fours, those are gonna cancel up, and then we're just gonna clean that up. Here's our final thing. Now, I still haven't taken the limit yet because I haven't plugged in yet. And see what that algebra did for us, it removed that problem area. Like if I plug in four, I get zero on the bottom there and that's a problem. 
And so the factoring and canceling, it worked out perfectly for us. Now I don't have that problem. So now when I plug into the, the floor into the bottom, I don't get zero on the bottom, which means I'm okay to plug in. Okay, so if I plug in four to the top for all these X's, plug in the four there, plug in the four there, four minus one is three, four plus two is three, so you get three over six, which is one half for your final answer. So like I said, please write that limit notation every step of the way when it gets to the point where you're ready to plug in, it's okay to plug in, that's when you can just go straight to the number part and you don't need to write that limit notation any longer. All right, so that's your algebraic technique there. I'm sure you guys remember how to factor stuff real good. When you see radicals, this technique we're gonna work with, so we did a factoring problem, now we're gonna do conjugates, right? We're gonna multiply by the conjugate. Remember the conjugate from your pre-cal days is you're gonna switch that sign right there. So what I'm gonna do is multiply by the same thing on the top and the bottom. I'm just gonna switch that one symbol. All right, and then the top part, so I'm gonna have my limit notation still. The top part, I'm gonna to need to multiply that out. Like you're doing um, distributive property, so I'm gonna take this times this, radical times a radical makes that radical disappear, so that's just gonna give us the two plus x, like radical nine times radical nine is just gonna be nine, right? And then you're gonna go this times this, and then, so when I do this times this, I get a positive radical two times that, and then a negative radical two times that, those are gonna cancel each other out, so I'm not even gonna bother writing that. And then we're gonna take negative radical two times a positive radical two, which is just gonna be a positive two right there, right? So you're gonna that for the top. Now the bottom part, I know this is gonna look messy sometimes. I just need you to smush that together on the bottom and then write that down. For some reason, when people do the conjugate, sometimes they not only change that minus to a plus, but they accidentally switch that plus inside the radical to a minus on one of these. It's just a fluky thing. It's just, I didn't know, they know they're not supposed to do that, but you just switch that one symbol right there. And then look, on the top part, you just got to combine like terms. This is a simple two plus X minus two. So those twos are gonna cancel out, all right? And then notice here, I still have my limit notation because I haven't plugged in yet. I still have the limit as X approaches zero. I have just a single X on the top. And then since I have an X on top, there's no plus or minus X to this X, so I'm allowed to cancel those out. And so I'm almost done with this thing. We've got the limit as X approaches zero. I just have a one on the top. And then now I'm to the point where it's okay to plug in. Because if I plugged in here, I got zero on the bottom, okay? And you get zero divided by zero. We don't know what that answer is. And so that's why we do the algebra. We do the canceling. And now I'm able to take this zero and plug that in place for the X right there. So now since I'm plugging in, now I don't need to write that limit notation anymore. And that's just, like I said, it's gonna help us out tremendously when we get to chapter two and not, you know, not, we're gonna be able to avoid those big deductions there. So this is just gonna be the square root of two plus the square root of two. So that's gonna end up being one over two times the square root of two, right? So like X plus X is a two X, radical two plus a radical two is one over two radical two. So notice how, if I had to graph that thing and guess that what my limit answer was, or if I had to do an XY chart for that and guess what that decimal answer was, I'm not sure what the decimal answer that is off the top of my head right there, but see the algebraic techniques gives us exact methods. We don't have to worry about graphing something that crazy and doing an XY chart, just go straight to the algebraic techniques and then we're good there. So factoring will be pretty good. Conjugates is good when you see the radical and then um, let's do this one here. We're going to simplify complex fractions, okay? So from our pre cal days, there's a shortcut to that. You don't need to do this the long way, okay? Especially when they get harder, you're going to want to know this shortcut right here. So remember when you have a complex fraction, that's when you have many fractions inside of larger fractions. Fractions within fractions, that's a complex fractions. Here, how do you get rid of those? Here's a shortcut. Here's what you do is you look at those many fractions, and you look at that, those denominators, and as you look at those numbers, you're gonna think, what is your common denominator? You would use a four, and the x plus four is your common denominator. So that's your magic number. And what we're gonna do, we're gonna multiply the top and the bottom by that magic number, by that same exact thing. Because remember why this is a legal step. You can't just multiply that and cancel it out. 
then you change a problem. If your answer is one third and you just decide to times it by three and get one, one third and one, that's two different things right there. But notice what I got right here in this box. This is simply equal to one. So I'm taking the expression multiplied by one. That's why that's a legal algebraic step. Now, what you're gonna do, this bottom part, we're just gonna smush it together. Don't multiply that stuff out on the bottom. You, your goal is to get something to cancel out here. So just smush that together on the bottom. You're gonna have four X, X plus four. And then here, you're gonna take this egg shaped thing, times it by the four times X plus four. So you're just looking at the top. You're taking this times this. See how the X plus four is canceled? You're left with one times four, which is a four. And then you got your minus sign, and you're taking this egg shaped thing times it by that. So see how the fours are gonna cancel? but you just got the one, the X plus four, but you gotta be careful because your minus seen one times X plus four, that binomial must be in the parentheses like that. So very common mistake, people forget the parentheses and then, then they have a sign mistake right there. Now notice, I haven't taken my limit yet. I haven't plugged in yet. And so I still must need to write that limit notation right there. And then I can simplify this. So this would be a four minus X minus four, Notice how those fours cancel out. So sometimes I'll simplify it like this. I'll have neat work and I'll have like a negative X right there. And so I just kind of do a little bit of steps above there. And then notice I have, since I have a negative X there and a positive X there, those X's are gonna cancel out and then clean it up for me if we do that there. So I got a negative one up top and then you got this four times X plus four on the bottom. So now we're gonna do a limit as X approaches zero and I'm gonna check and see if I can plug in right here. So if I plug in zero for that X, you get zero plus four, which is four. So you have negative one over four times four, which is a negative one over 16 for your final answer. If you graph whatever this function is, whatever this craziness is on that graph, and you look at what are the Y values doing from the left side and the right hand side of that zero, you're gonna get this negative one over 16 right. All right, the last one, this one's really, really simple here. Um, this technique, we're just gonna multiply it all out. The reason I wanna show you this one though is because it has this delta X notation. We're gonna use that strictly once we hit, once we hit derivatives. And so this is just like an X plus H squared or an X plus Y squared. It's just a different variable. And so you're gonna multiply this out like X plus delta X times an X plus delta X. That's two different variables, like an X plus H times an X plus H, but I need us to use those because a lot of college textbooks will use that delta X notation and want us to use that, okay? Some books will use just an H, and so you use whatever that college professor wants you to do though. But notice when you plug in zero for that delta X, you get zero on the denominator, which just means your function's undefined, but your limit may still exist. So when you multiply this out, just be careful. Use your distributive property. You're gonna go X times X, which is an X squared, and then you're gonna go X plus delta X and another X times delta X, so that's gonna be a two X delta X. And then you have delta X times delta X. That's gonna be just your delta X squared. You don't need to do triangle squared X squared. It's just your delta X is your variable and then you're squaring it. And then just be careful because a lot of times people forget that single X right there. So it's an X times delta X, X times delta X. So there's two of those. And then on the bottom part, also that's just this piece. And then you have this minus X squared that's going to carry down. And then the bottom part, you just have this delta X right there. Now we're gonna do this limit as delta X approaches zero. And then now I still can't plug in because I'm getting zero on the bottom. So my limit notation is still there. But look, I got a positive X squared, negative X squared, those are done. And then everything that's left standing has a delta X attached to it, which means we can do a GCF. I can factor out a delta X. I'll be left with a two X plus a delta X. And that is very helpful because now look what I can do. I'm allowed to cancel out those delta X's. And so now the final cleaned up version right there, limit as delta X approaches zero of the two X plus the delta X. I'm gonna plug in zero, not for that X, you're plugging in zero for the delta X. So two X plus zero is gonna be two X for our final answer. So a lot of these you're gonna get some numbers for, but sometimes you're gonna get some variables involved in these problems right there. So those are your main algebraic I, um, techniques. Now I gotta stress that these algebraic techniques only work on your normal functions, okay? These are all considered normal functions. What's not a normal function would be a piecewise function, would be something called a greatest integer function, which if we see that, I'll talk about that. Um, 
when we need to. Also, the instant you see absolute value bars, those aren't normal functions, okay? So on an absolute value bar, you can't just plug in and get an answer right there. You might get lucky and get it right. Most likely you're gonna get it wrong, okay? So when you see absolute value bars, when you see piecewise functions, when you see the greatest integer function is what you're gonna need to do is make an XY chart or a graph. Now, my guess is you're not sure what the graph that looks like right now. So what we could do is go back to what we did originally is just make an XY chart there. If I'm approaching negative four from the left, that's from this side on the number line. So that's like negative 4.1, negative 4.01, negative 4.001. And then if I'm approaching it from the right-hand side, that's the negative 3.9 side. So get closer to that, negative 3.99, negative 3.999. And you're simply gonna take those numbers, plug those in place for X into the calculator. We don't need to be doing anything weird with this. This, this method is gonna help us out when we get to some integrals later on. We'll work with graphs and stuff with those. But what happens is when you plug those numbers in, you get negative ones for all of the answers. And then over here, you're gonna get positive ones for all of the answers. And remember, so this is like our left side limit. This is our right side limit. Since I did not get the same thing for both of them, this limit answer does not exist. Anytime a limit doesn't exist, we're gonna say why. We're going to say left-handed limit is not equal to that right-handed limit. If you do this graph, which I know we don't quite know how to graph this thing yet, but we'll graph more stuff like this in the future. But this is what the graph looks like. Negative four is over here. And then your graph picks up right here and goes this way. Your graph picks up right here and goes this way. And if I say what's the limit as X approaches negative four, of that function, you would do your graphical approach, all right? From the left-hand side, you're down there at a negative one. From the right-hand side, you're up there at a positive one. See how you're not converging, all right? If you're those stick figure people, you're not converging upon that same picnic table. You're gonna be at two different picnic tables, so that limit doesn't exist. Your left-hand limit is not equal to the right-hand limit. And just while it's on my mind, you can kind of jot this down if you want there, but just some rules that were used throughout the year. It's okay for the entire year to leave radicals in the denominator. So either one is acceptable, but you gotta get the exact answer, not the decimal answer, but that's okay to leave it like that. We should always pull out perfect square. So if your answer is square to 12, don't leave it like that, make that two radical three. Also, if you have any negative exponents for the entire year, I don't care like what the back of the book is doing at all. When we get to derivatives and stuff, anytime you have a negative exponent, you should get rid of that and make that a positive exponent right there.